Bite marks tend to be found in particularly violent crime scenes where a struggle has taken place, with both suspects and victims known to use their teeth as a means to inflict pain on the other person. Bite marks can also be found on objects at the crime scene, such as food, although this is much less common. While we might assume that most bite marks will leave a nice, neat pattern of two arches with clearly defined dental marks, this is far from the reality. The violence and force of an attack involving biting means the wound often becomes distorted and complex, featuring multiple abrasions and bruises that can be really difficult to discern, even by trained professionals. In the past, Bite marks were thought to be unique enough to identify a particular person, almost in the same way we use fingerprints. However, it is now generally accepted that bite mark evidence is best used alongside other forensic evidence as a tool to help rule people in or out as possible contributors, and not as a means to identify and match specific individuals. Another way that bite marks can be used is by swabbing them for any DNA that might have been left by the biter, and this is a much more reliable way of identifying someone rather than attempting to compare and match their teeth impressions. The use of bite mark evidence in American criminal trials dates all the way back to 1692 during the Salem Witch Trials. Reverend George Burroughs was put on trial, accused of witchcraft and conspiring with the devil, with the only physical evidence presented being bite marks found on some girls he had supposedly recruited. Historians have noted that at trial, the defendant's mouth was pried open and the prosecution compared his teeth with the teeth marks left on the bodies of several injured girls present in the courtroom. Two decades after being found guilty and having been executed for these crimes, he was exonerated by the state. Fast forward to 1979, bite mark analysis was gaining momentum in the field of forensic science when it was put into the public spotlight for the first time, after being used as evidence at the trial of one of America's most notorious serial killers, Ted Bundy. During the original trial, the forensic odontologist, or dentist, displayed a photo of bite marks that had been found on the victim, and then placed a transparent sheet on top of that, which had Bundy's dental impressions. He declared to the jury that they were an exact match, even adding that bite marks are as good as a fingerprint for identifying individuals. While there is no standardised method of how to analyse a bite mark, it usually involves a visual inspection, including detailed measurements and photographs being taken. A forensic odontologist would then create moulds or take an x-ray of the suspected biter's teeth to try and determine whether it fits into the bite mark impression or not. The issue is, this is not exactly scientific or objective and relies on two assumptions. The first being that human dentition is unique. While our teeth are all arranged in a similar pattern, variations can occur due to genetics and our external environment. Things like your diet, health problems or dental treatment can help to build a unique dental profile that a forensic odontologist can use to either rule people in or out. The second assumption is that human skin is able to register and record the unique features of a bite in a useful way. The problem with this is that human skin does not act like a perfect mould. The structural property and elasticity of our skin varies at different areas of our bodies, but also varies with age, ethnicity and gender. In a living victim, bruising can disappear quickly depending on how much force the biter used. Generally speaking though, bruises can appear up to four hours after the bite occurred and disappear after 36 hours. The bruising left from a bite mark can become distorted due to changes in the body's position after being bitten. This is because the bruising diffuses into the surrounding tissue, which can become worse as the wound swells or if it becomes infected. In a deceased victim, lividity, or the settling of blood after death, can also alter or hide the appearance of a bite mark. 
The natural processes that occur after death can further distort any marks left on the body, including decomposition, putrefaction, shrinkage or bloating of the skin, and rigor mortis. Any distortion will likely affect how detailed the transfer of the biter's dentition into the skin is. This has the potential to result in inaccurate measurements and misleading pattern interpretation by the forensic odontologists. In 2009, a report released by the National Academy of Sciences highlighted the lack of scientific validation in bite mark analysis. In 2015, researchers Dr Pretty and Dr Freeman carried out a study with the aim of seeing if they could establish reliability within their field of bite mark analysis. They asked ABFO certified dentists to analyse sets of bite marks and use what they called a decision tree, or a flowchart, to show their methodology. They were asked to determine if the injury that they were looking at was a bite mark, whether it was suggestive of a bite mark, or if it was not a bite mark. The results of this study revealed a shocking lack of consensus. The analysts came to a unanimous agreement on just four out of the 100 case studies they looked at. More recently, in 2016, the Texas Forensic Science Commission concluded a six-month investigation into bite mark analysis. They called for an end of the use of bite mark testimony in criminal trials, as it does not meet the standards of forensic science. Unfortunately, the shaky scientific foundation of this field is still not widely known. When presented with bite marks as evidence, Juries have been easily convinced of its accuracy. The Innocence Project lists 26 people who have been wrongfully convicted based on bite mark evidence and later exonerated. They estimate the true number of people wrongfully convicted using bite mark evidence to be much higher. Let's take a look at a case involving bite marks from Mississippi that has recently been back in the news. On the 2nd of February 1992, a call to 911 was made by someone who saw smoke coming from their neighbour's house. When they arrived, the police from Columbus, Mississippi made a horrifying discovery. The body of 82-year-old Georgia Kemp was on the floor in the bedroom of her smouldering house. An autopsy concluded that she died from two stab wounds to her chest and had suffered injuries suggestive of a violent rape. This initial report made no mention of any bite marks found on Mrs Kemp's body. However, just three days after she was buried, her body was exhumed for further testing. Following this examination, a forensic odontologist and self-proclaimed expert in bite mark analysis called Dr Michael West examined the body and claimed to have found bite marks on the victim's right breast, the back of her right arm and between her neck and shoulder. Although no photographs of these wounds have ever been published, Dr West was convinced of his findings. By this point in the investigation, the police had already turned their attention to a man who lived just two blocks away from the victim and had a criminal record that included two sexual offences. Eddie Lee Howard was 41 and unemployed at the time and he was seen as the obvious suspect. The police took impressions of his teeth which were later compared to the apparent bite marks found on Mrs Kemp's body. Although Eddie Lee Howard's upper teeth were comprised of a mass-produced denture, Dr West proclaimed that the injuries were consistent with his dentition, going so far as to say that the wound on the victim's right breast was indeed and without a doubt inflicted by Howard. Eddie Lee Howard was later arrested and went to trial in May 1994 where he represented himself. The state relied on the apparent expert testimony from Dr West since there was no blood, semen or any other type of evidence connecting Eddie Lee Howard to the murder. Unfortunately, he struggled to present the coherent defence which was needed to attack the credibility and reliability of the bite mark evidence presented by the state. 
it took the jury only 35 minutes before they found him guilty of capital murder. In 1997, this conviction was thrown out on the grounds that the court failed to make sure that Eddie Lee Howard was competent enough to represent himself. A new trial took place in May 2000, and despite having legal representation this time around, the trial went just as badly for him as it did the first time. His defence did not call any witnesses or experts of their own, and again the state had Dr West testify that he had matched the wounds on Mrs Kemp's body with Eddie Lee Howard's teeth. He was found guilty and sentenced to death for the second time. While Eddie Lee Howard sat on death row, he went through the process of filing appeals and petitions, but all were denied. Thankfully, something important was happening behind the scenes. The Innocence Project were working with other clients in the state of Mississippi, whose convictions largely centred around questionable bite mark analysis. All of these cases also featured the so-called expert testimony of Dr West, whose findings were beginning to be widely questioned and reviewed. When DNA evidence exonerated a man named Kennedy Brewer, and later Levon Brooks, both of whom had been convicted based largely on bite mark evidence, the Innocence Project decided to examine other cases where Dr West had testified about finding bite marks, which is when they became aware of Eddie Lee Howard's case. Eventually in 2016, after new evidence was tested for DNA, an evidentiary hearing took place. Eddie Lee Howard's legal team revealed that Mrs Kemp's nightgown, stockings and slippers all tested negative for semen. They also showed that the rape kit and the bedding had been tested and were both negative for semen and male DNA. The only male DNA found was on the knife but this excluded Eddie Lee Howard as a contributor and pointed to an unidentified male as the real killer. His defence also called multiple experts in the field of dentistry to explain that the American Board of Forensic Odontology had since changed its guidelines in relation to bite marks and that Dr West's testimony would not have been admissible under these revisions. Dr Ian Pretty explained that new research indicated that even experts were unable to reliably distinguish between human bite marks and other injuries. He also stated that Dr West only examined the body after it had been exhumed, and that this, along with the unembalming process, would have really limited any doctor's ability to examine the body and identify specific injuries. Eddie Lee Howard's conviction and death sentence was overturned by the Mississippi Supreme Court in August 2020 in a landmark decision that finally acknowledged how unreliable the pseudoscience of bite mark analysis is. After spending 26 years on death row for a crime he did not commit, Eddie Lee Howard was finally released from prison and in January of 2021, he was finally exonerated. The Innocence Project continues to help those wrongfully convicted based on flawed science like bite mark evidence, but the organisation stresses the importance of creating fundamental changes that can prevent people being wrongfully convicted based on debunked and unreliable evidence in the first place. One of the main issues that they point to is that most defence attorneys, prosecutors and even judges are not well versed in the scientific background and methodology of certain forensic fields. Encouraging judges and the criminal justice system as a whole to be much more sceptical of new and emerging forensic techniques could help to reduce the chances of flawed evidence being deemed admissible.